Voice of San Diego podcasts are sponsored in part by Hughes Marino. As a nonprofit news organization, Voice of San Diego depends on our members, foundations, and sponsors like Hughes Marino to provide funding to support the investigative journalism you expect from us. We are very grateful for all of our supporters, and we will recognize them during the show. Hughes Marino is San Diego's award-winning commercial real estate firm that exclusively represents tenants and buyers, never landlords. Their wide range of services include tenant representation, project and construction management, lease audit and administration, and culture and design consulting. Whether you're leasing, buying, or building, Hughes Marino can help you find the perfect space for your company to innovate and grow towards the future. Visit HughesMarino.com to learn more. And if you like our work and would like to become a sponsor, contact us at development at voiceofsandiego.org. Welcome to the Voice of San Diego podcast, where we make sense of local politics, schools, housing, public safety, the civic issues that impact the life of a San Diego resident. We break it down so you can understand it and make educated decisions. Everything that goes into our investigative reporting, the journalists, public records requests, the data crunching, and this very show depends on the support of people like you because we're a nonprofit news organization. Enjoy the show. Welcome to those of you listening on News Radio 600 Kogo. My name is Scott Lewis. I'm here with my friend Andrew Keats. What's up? What's up, dude? Yep. It's Sarah Libby. Hey. How are you? Doing good. I am. Let's do this. I am ready today. Uh huh. This uh, this week, the former leader of the San, uh, California State Senate, Kevin DeLeon, he's running for United real, States Senate. Real Senate. Real Senate. <laughs> <laughs> he was in San Diego, and he was touting his quote, sanctuary policy. So I guess we are done with the guidance that they shouldn't be called sanctuary policies. Actually, yeah. what it was was like a, a very stark claim that we have never called them yeah. sanctuary policies. It's yeah. only the other side that says that. You need to stop repeating them. Yeah. So yeah. he he wrote the sanctuary policies and he called them sanctuary, sanctuary policies. policies. So there so, you go. Yeah. He was in town talking about how much benefit they've had in, in encouraging cooperation between the community and police. But I wanted to follow up. So we spent last episode talking all about this topic and about the reality versus the fever dream about these laws on both sides. And uh, there was one part of it that we left out that I ended up writing about in the uh, Voice of San Diego online news, investigative news website. Mm -hmm. And it was about this particular issue that came up. There was a press conference and we had quoted Diane Harkey, uh, who's running for Congress in the press conference. Uh, she's a Republican, and uh, she was there, and she told she had told a story about a, a business person, a man who uh, had a longtime employee who had risen the ranks, become a management employee, and had uh, become you know an important person, somebody loyal. He was an unauthorized immigrant, and she said uh, he just disappeared, just. Uh, vanished one day. And it was because the workplace was about to be audited by the Immigration and Customs Enforcement Service. And she said, look, quote, nobody wants that. And that did not happen before. It just didn't happen before. They were picking up violent criminals at the jail. There was cooperation at those jails. And now they're going into businesses, Harkey said. And that's because now this law, this sanctuary policies law, this SB 54 law that was causing ICE to go and deport people. Then there was uh, Sam Abed, Escondido's mayor. He had a similar take. He said, quote, the concern among his, his, the Hispanic community is growing now because ICE is separating families. They, they went to a transit station, right? They did a sweep without our police involvement, without our police knowledge. What did they do? They arrested and deported 115 of them of illegal immigrants. And now all of them are criminals. Not all of them are criminals. And that's what SB 54 is doing to our immigrant community. So we had this bizarre situation where these two Republicans, upset about sanctuary policies, said the sanctuary policies did not go far enough and did not protect unauthorized immigrants well enough. Yeah. It's especially rich coming from a leader of Escondido, which has sort of established itself nationally as like one of the most hostile cities to immigrants 
in the country. It's been called like Little Arizona, if you remember some yeah. Sheriff Joe policies from a while back. Um, so to hear Sam Ahmed saying, you know, they should be protecting these immigrants is really strange. Yeah, and so it's this, it's kind of this like post Pete Wilson, like GOP reckoning of like, we can't be seen as hostile to immigrants. So we're saying like, it's, it's actually the Democrats who are causing this. And I think uh, I just, so it, I, it started to bother me, it bothered me more. It, it was, and so I looked into data, like there's, there's absolutely no evidence that there is any right now, any indication that they're deporting more law abiding unauthorized immigrants because of this sanctuary policy law. Uh, this sweep that he mentioned in Escondido uh, was called routine by ICE, and ICE has had no qualms criticizing the sanctuary policies, the, the SB 54. There have been workplace raids across the country. Uh, the area that, that had the most law-abiding sort of uh, arrests of, of people who were here unauthorized was San Diego, and that was before the law was passed. And then the area with the most uh, for the whole year last year was uh, Pennsylvania. They don't have any of these policies. There's a big workplace raid in Tennessee. I can go on and on and on. The point being like, there is no, we have no indication right now that, uh, that more people who are just working and following the law uh, are being removed because of these policies. And in fact, these policies you you can still transfer violent criminals to ICE. You can still notify ICE when it happens. It's just uh, it was just a, a bizarre argument that uh, I wanted to uh, really nail down. Yeah, I mean, the one possibility is that the claim that they desperately want these law-abiding citizens not to be deported um, is that it's not true. Yes, right. That's that seems like 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 and a possibility. and if it, and if. If it is true that they desperately want these law-abiding citizens not to be subject to deportation, then uh, they could petition their friends in the federal government, who they they are in many ways rallying to yeah. by opposing these state laws, and encourage them to revert to the old policies to deprioritize people who are law-abiding citizens, which was a policy that was wiped clean at the start of the Trump administration. And either they're being disingenuous or they're just genuinely naive that the Trump administration and ICE want to deport everyone. Which is odd because they've said it clearly. Yeah. They like they're not, they're not mincing their words around this question. Yeah. I mean, if you look back to um, all those child migrants who were crossing the border, I mean, Murrieta is not far from Escondido. They were stopping buses in the streets to force children to go back you know those aren't lawbreakers um mm -hmm. so to now say that like oh we want to protect them i think it's it, i don't think it's naive i think it's disingenuous the president himself removed all of the restrictions that ice and border patrol had on prioritizing criminals and the border patrol union chief told our mario Coran that they felt unshackled finally that they <clears throat> they felt it was inappropriate to prioritize people like that. They that we should all just accept that this is what is happening and what they want to do. <laughs> and if we don't like it, we that's that's kind of an issue we have with them and not necessarily the state of California. It would certainly be more helpful to have a policy discussion where we're all very clear about what the priorities for different people involved in the discussion are as opposed to fighting over who most wants to protect people here here who are here without legal status right okay we have a lot going on in today's show we have uh for the interview tommy how he's running for chris kate's seat at uh, in district six of the san diego city council and uh but that'll be almost it for our candidates uh debates or discussions but we have one coming it sounds like the former da Former District Attorney Bonnie Dumanis is going to join us on this program in this studio. Uh, so we will won't count our eggs before they're hatched, but uh, that is a interesting one. And also, um, this is we're in the middle of our spring campaign. None of this is free. All of this work we do, and the people, and the parking, and the driving, and all the, t the type typewriters, <laughs> mm -hmm, <laughs> they cost mm -hmm. money. All of them. Uh, they cost money. So please consider donating. Go to voiceofsandiego.org slash donate if you support what we do. Okay, we have a few stories we wanted to run through. First off, 
You know the port? It owns land behind the convention center, but it's long been leased by a partnership called the Fifth Avenue Landing LLC. Those two guys, Art Engel and Ray Carpenter. I met with them a while ago. They want to build a hotel there. Uh, the city, of course, had the option to, to buy that lease from them so they could expand the convention center. They had it, right? They, they had were, They were making payments. They were making payments to take it over, and then they just stopped. The city just stopped paying. Seems like a problem. So they could have got that land for like 10 to $12 million, and, um, and then they would have been able to build a convention center on top. But uh, they stopped paying, and so these guys came up with this plan to build a hotel. And last week, the Port Commission met behind closed doors to talk about how much the port may be willing to contribute to contribute to pay those guys off so that they can um, give that lease over. So we'll have to pay close attention to how much that final payment is in comparison to the $12 million that the city of San Diego had as its right and simply needed to continue making the payments on. And they decided not to. And lest you think we're judging in hindsight, this was uh, this was something that people took great attention to at the time that it happened. Contemporaneously. Yeah, it was contemporaneously. This was a very controversial decision. And it was kind of washed away by a lot of people as like, well, we don't have the money or the authority to build a convention center right now. So what are we paying for this for? If we want to get it again, we'll just renegotiate to get it again. But these guys had a, a right to pursue a hotel and they went ahead and did that. They sent the letter, uh, hundreds of letters to the, well, not hundreds, but a bunch of letters to the city and the convention center saying, are you sure? Yeah. Are, we, you, are you sure you don't want to pay us for this? Because we, we're, we're going to go on and with our own plans. And th there's been, uh, I guess, like a belief that, that these guys are bluffing. Like they have no real intent to build a hotel. They're exacting as much leverage as they can so that they can get more money for the land to go back to them. I, I guess it doesn't really matter whether that's true or not, really, because if you if they end up spending $30 million, $20 million, $50 million for land that they already had their stinking paws around for $12 million, it'll be disgustingly gross mismanagement of city finances. It's bananas. It's it, such a big deal. Especially because I don't know if you've picked up on this, but expanding the convention center is a really big deal <laughs> to, to, thinking about, yeah. to very pow powerful people in this city. The hotel industry, the tourism industry, uh, the people who run the convention center, the port, Mayor Faulkner, the Chamber of Commerce, they've always really wanted to do this. So the idea that they would just like give away this land where it would be required and and like walk away from the deal or something is was not a, a great bet. <laughs> it's not a great bet. And so and the other thing that's happening is the port is like a week or two away, about two weeks away from the next step in this hotel approval. Like the, the, so even if it's fake hotel it's going through the process right now of being approved yeah i mean if, they, if, they, if this is if this is a bit they've they've really sold themselves yeah. to it they're really on right uh, okay so watch that we've got i'm sure news will break on that in the next couple of days all right you have an update from our friends at the neighborhood market association yeah so this is the organization that's composed of hundreds of these small corner stores, grocery stores, liquor stores around the county. Uh, they play, pay into it as the Neighborhood Market Association. Um, it's a politically relevant organization in town and has been for a while. They uh, played a big part in conversations around the plastic bag ban, the beach booze ban, uh, minimum wage increase. Yeah, if a liquor store wants to sell single cans of of beer, beer yeah and a city wants to ban that they're the guys that show up and say don't do that right and they also really raised their political profile a few years ago when their uh the leader at the time marco rabo uh elevated his profile by getting involved in the syrian civil war and the and problems with isis in iraq and the refugee crisis there they also got sued we've been over this if you've been on the show but they got sued by other members who alleged essentially that the uh, board of directors of the Neighborhood Market Association had agreed to improper payments. They had been misled by Arabo and gave him money to which he was not truly entitled. Uh, a judge agreed with them late last year and ordered Arabo to pay that money back. They've since been put into receivership. Um, and 
most recently, the receiver wrote this really remarkable report. One of the things he was required to do was to produce a report describing the uh, this contract that Arabo's private consulting company had to manage NMA finances and to tell the judge what we should do to untangle that contract. And his report is just this exasperated document about his inability to get basic information from Arabo or anyone associated with the Neighborhood Market Association, after which he concluded not only that they should tr try to act as quickly as they can to end that contract, but also that they should bar Arabo and other uh, board mem former board members from running for the board again, mm -hmm. that they should just say, no, you're out, basically just barred from running this organization. Arabo shot back in his own declaration where he compared the receiver and the plaintiffs and the judge to an Iraqi-style coup d'etat. Hearkening back to the days of Saddam Hussein. Saddam Hussein, it is. Yeah, and that was like one in a series of these just bananas legal. F so the judge made a ruling. He didn't just rule against Arabo. He eviscerated Arabo in this insane ruling. Language then, you just don't hear from the bench often. Yeah. I mean, like bananas legal filings are yeah. my exact jam. <laughs> <Yeah>. um, <laughs> yeah. Just some, something about seeing it in that court letterhead yeah, yeah. Um, makes All it so much All the way to the, the wide official. margins. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Um, and so this one uh, that Arabo wrote responding to the receiver, uh, you know, the uh, Iraqi style coup d'etat, but it was full of a lot of gems. You should definitely go read Andy's story. Um, to see them. <laughs> There's nowhere f more for this to go to ratchet up to. The, yeah. This case, everything about it, everyone is is using the the most uh, exaggerated, hyperbolic, hyperbolic language they yeah. can. Yeah. All right. So all across the region, I didn't know this, but thank you for telling me. There are cameras capturing traffic and license plate numbers, and it goes into a database. And police departments love it. They can locate a suspect. They can uh, find a stolen car. And all they have to do is enter a license plate number. But you found they're supposed to do a few other things after they make a search like that. Huh? Right. So back in 2015, a state law was passed. It's It was a pretty modest law. It was not even opposed by law enforcement. And it was intended to regulate the use of this data. Um, it's I, th I think its most interesting provision was that every time somebody associated with a law enforcement agency in the state logs in, they just need to put in some basic information about why they're doing it. They need to say who they are, where they are, it records the GPS, uh, when they're doing it, and why. And what, what's that intended to safeguard against? What types of so like, I think, abuses? Yeah, so I mean, I think one of the abuses, for one, it's just, I think people have concerns about the privacy in general of, of this sort of network. But one very specific type of misuse you could imagine is an officer using it to I don't know, uh, look into the whereabouts of a journalist that they don't like or sure. to look into the whereabouts of an ex-wife that they had a falling out with uh, or something along those lines. And so if you have a, a formal log of everyone who's used the system and why they used the system, um, then you can at least police these things. And it's it's just a, a pretty simple regulation, right? Well, uh, the Electronic Frontier Foundation has issued hundreds, hundreds of public records requests across the country for how departments are using this data. Um, and since in the city of San Diego, it's all neatly posted on next request. Uh, what came back in that records uh, request was a uh, an, these audits that the SDPD has done uh, intermittently just to take a look at who's using their system and for what purpose. Um, and what they show is that almost half the time, no one is including a reason in the specific reason field. And sometimes they're not even listing other basic information. Yeah, so the SDPD's perspective on this is that if they put a case number in, that's as good as a reason. That, that even basic, though they're two separate requirements. Even though they're two separate fields in the thing. Um, they So they say that if they put in a case number, but, but there's a smaller amount of time, there's no case number and there's no reason which would make it very difficult to know why somebody was looking into this. Um, I talked to the the law marker, Jerry Hill, who wrote the, the legislation. He said he, he's not interested in rendering a verdict about whether this case number specifically qualifies as a reason. He said that um, he just wanted to create a system that would force each local agency to adopt a, a policy 
and then they could have transparent discussions with their constituents uh, about whether they were uh, in good faith making good on that promise, uh, that policy. And he uh, he applauded the exchange I've had with STPD and said um, that it was exactly what he was looking for because this has produced the STPD is going to uh, submit a change to their procedure that stipulates that there must be either a case number or a reason. So, there so you what go. they're doing is fine, but they're going to change it. That is it. A accurate it. description of what took place. Yes. Our hero of the week. This goes to my, my very good buddy, our longtime education reporter, Mario Coran, who is, uh, has announced that he is leaving Voice of San Diego. Friday is his last day. He's leaving San Diego entirely. Uh, he was He's forced to relocate with his family back from where he's from, Milwaukee, uh, we obviously, as an organization and as a city, benefited greatly from his stellar coverage of the of San Diego Unified over the years. Resulted in uh, a board member being forced to resign from that seat based on her improper influence of her uh, son's school. Uh, he's shed light out on the graduation numbers at the at the uh, San Diego Unified School District he has in every way really raised hell for the last uh last 4 years and uh it's exactly what we try to do here and I'm I'm going to miss him All right me too <laughs> our goat of the week you lose good day sir okay so since september uh, one San Diego man has filed nine lawsuits against properties hosting unpermitted marijuana storefronts uh, he alleges that they are discriminating against customers with disabilities. This uh, this man, Karel Skype Spikes, claims that he suffered difficulty or embarrassment by not being able to enter the dispensaries. He really wants to go to them. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah, uh, he just really wants to. His uh, the these shops, of course, they're illegal, and so they have a little higher incentive to settle those suits. And he he says, look, he's not incredibly what's the term uh, litigious. litigious. Uh, because he's only done nine of them, not ten. He's done hundreds of others in federal court, but yeah. I guess that doesn't count. <laughs> yeah. So we have this situation where the law is incentivizing these sorts of suits that may or may not be um, genuine attempts to p- get access to these illegal pot shops. But we also have this explosion of pot shops because there's not very coherent strategy on the county level for how they're going to stamp them out right uh and sometimes they close them as our kenzie moreland did a, a great story about how they close some of these uh, pot shops that are unregulated in the unincorporated part of the county but then they just pop back up so all right stay tuned we have our interview with tommy howe and um and please again consider donating at voice of san org slash donate to help us meet our spring campaign goals and thank you to news radio 600 Go. This podcast is sponsored in part by an anonymous donor of Make-A-Wish San Diego. As a nonprofit news organization, Voice of San Diego depends on our members, foundations, and sponsors like Make-A-Wish. We are very grateful for all of our supporters and will recognize their support during our shows. San Diego's Walk for Wishes is a family-friendly community event coming up on April 28th at the Embarcadero Marina Park South. Form a team with your friends, family, and co-workers and join Make-A-Wish San Diego on Walk Day. All participants are encouraged to raise money to help grant wishes of kids with critical illnesses in our community. Visit www.sandiego.wish.org slash walk to learn more. Proceeds benefit Make-A-Wish. And if you like Voice of San Diego's work and want to become a sponsor, contact us at development at voiceofsandiego.org. We are joined by District 6 City Council candidate Tommy Howe. Tommy, how's it going, man? It's going well. It's good to see you. Yeah, so I don't know if people can can hear it right from that that voice, but uh, <laughs> they they might already know you. Uh, if they don't know your face, they might know you, your your voice from years on the radio locally. Most recently at ninety four nine, right? Ninety one X. I did 91X. mornings at ninety one X for a couple of years. I was at uh, KPRI briefly, and then I was at uh, FM ninety four nine, which is 
now called Alt 94.9. They changed the name on us, but oh, uh, I, didn't even know that. I was there for 10 years. And yes, this is the most normal thing I'll do all day. So this <laughs> is this is great. Yeah. So you you launched your campaign for the uh, D6 seat, which is currently held by Chris Kate. That's right. Uh, back in what no, it was like November. Uh, the committee opened in November. We announced in October. OK, so how's it going? This is your first foray into elected politics? This is my first foray into elected politics. It, it's it been uh, a whirlwind, and I guess that's sort of a cliche to say that, but the great thing about it is that you wind up learning something radically new every day, and you wind up meeting new people, and, and you wind up building this collection of stories from people you meet at the door, people you speak with on the phone, and at some point, I'm looking forward to looking back on this in some way and, and just processing it all because every day we, I'm just, we just get so much new material coming in and it's, it's been great. Yeah. Well, so I want to get into some of the things you've learned in the race and some of the things that you're, you're hanging your campaign on. But uh, first, let's learn a little bit about yourself. Uh, how'd you get to San Diego? So I came to San Diego at the end of 2002 when I was hired by what was then FM 94.9. That was the old Jefferson Pilot Cluster in Mission Valley. And uh, the gentleman who hired me, I had worked for him in Seattle and I'd been there for several years and uh, said there was an opportunity, a really unique radio opportunity in, in San Diego. I'd been working in broadcasting by that time for about 10 years really professionally. And uh, I came down and I heard the station and I'd, I'd really never heard anything like it. Yeah, it was a, a you, can, you can tell people a little bit, but 94.9 at that point was a kind of a known nationally station, right? It was well, kind we, of cutting edge. Yeah, I mean, we, we had just launched, but we were breaking a lot of the rules of what rock radio was doing. And we were sort of uh, programming ourselves and setting ourselves up like this thing called an iPod, which <laughs> was very, very new in 2002. Yeah. And so we were the first rock station to start playing Johnny Cash, just as a matter of normalcy. But we were also delving into the catalogs of The Clash, and the Pixies. And we would play these real deep cuts from Nirvana that no one had thought of for 10 years. And it was just a very, very different radio station. But the interesting thing was that the uh, ears had been tenderized so well here in San Diego for years that people were extraordinarily receptive to it. In fact, they were thrilled about it. Yeah. And it was a fun place to work. So when in that period did you first encounter the sublime quota? <laughs> 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 replaced today by the 21 pilots quota yeah sure i i have i have it's truly a phenomenon of southern california radio and it's magical yeah. oh you know what's funny is i had worked in in ohio yeah because i went to college in ohio and so i was there when that Where'd album you go came to college out. i went to ohio university in athens ohio oh, OU, go yeah. bobcats my yeah. uh my in-laws are ou uh graduates i went to ohio wesleyan Oh, is that right? Yeah. That's up by Cleveland, right? Uh, it's in between Columbus and Cleveland. Yeah. Okay. Oh, yeah. that's great. Yeah. I'm, yeah. So I'm a Bobcat, Middle American Conference. Yeah. and uh, I Great broadcasting my... school. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, that's, in fact, the program that I'd, I'd gone through was, was their broadcasting program. Yeah. But uh, at any rate, I'd been working in Ohio and that Sublime record came out. And uh, when I came to Southern California, I was astonished at the volume of tracks on there and how every single person knew them. Oh, yeah. Everybody. It Everybody. Amazing. It's wild. Uh, okay. So, so where are you from? Where'd you grow up? So I'm from Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Okay. Uh, born and raised there. And, uh, you know, I've been a, registered there as a Democrat back in 1987 for my first election. Mm -hmm. There I just dated myself uh, <laughs> and uh, went off to college at Ohio U. And I, I worked in Ohio for a couple of years after school. And then I, I wound up moving out to Seattle to go glacier climbing. Interesting. So you were in the Pacific Northwest for a little while in between. Was there for several years. This is about 20 pounds ago, but uh, used to go out and, and, and just spend all my time outdoors. But what that did was it sort of solidified a lot of uh, environmental and conservation concerns that I had grown up with and that I had experienced. I mean, as a kid growing up in Western Pennsylvania, it's, it's sort of seen as deer hunter country. Now, I, I wasn't a hunter, but I remember going and, and sort of learning wilderness basics in the uh, you know, these places like the Monongahela National Forest in West Virginia and uh, these state parks in Maryland and these, yeah. these, these, these foothills of the Appalachians in Western Pennsylvania. And then when in Ohio, you know, I was going to college in the Southeast area, which is very rural, which is the Appalachians. And I really became more aware of the larger impact of poverty. And you would see communities that had no political representation. You would see how these communities were exploited and it was shocking. And uh, later I, I read about, you know, when John F. Kennedy went to these communities and he was stunned that this was the United States. And so right next to these amazing wilderness areas, you would see such crippling poverty. Um, 
And then I went out to the Pacific Northwest, and that was a whole different kind of, uh, of conservation. That, that's really where I began to cut my teeth as, as an environmentalist. Yeah, so tell us how you, when you first started dipping your toes into something that was overtly political. Well, I've always been a politically minded individual, even when I was a, a kid. I remember, I'm going to date myself again, but I remember back in 1976 when Jimmy Carter won the presidency, and that was one of those all-nighters. And I was a little, little kid back then, but I remember... The joy in my household uh, when, when Carter won. And it was, it was, even then I could appreciate how for my, my, my parents, my mother especially, how it, it really, it was like when Obama got elected. It was like, thank Great. God that era <laughs> is over. You know, we're past that now. We're moving into something new. Yeah. And then four years later, I remember, you know, the concern when, when Reagan was elected. Yeah. Uh, and Never and, heard of anyone having a transformative experience with Jimmy Carter. That's really interesting. That's because you weren't around back then. <laughs> no, but even as a <laughs> on the heels, student of presidential history, yeah. that's really on the, interesting. On the heels of yeah. Watergate and Vietnam, it was a real sea change. And I was a little kid back then, but I, I, I do remember the, the, the feeling of hope and excitement yeah. uh, when he came into office. Yeah. And so as you, were, as you were working in radio, what was your level of involvement, if any, in politics? Limited, unfortunately. Um, you know, typically in broadcasting, you have to be to the right of Attila the Hun to go and get a talk show because uh, right wing talk became its own format. Yeah. And right wing talk was basically built upon terrified white people. And that's really what right wing talk has been with Rush Limbaugh and these other hosts for the last 30 odd years. And what precipitated that was Reagan's undoing of the fairness doctrine back in 1987. And so you, no one, a, a, stations were not bound by any sort of restriction anymore on, on having some appearance of fairness. And these are still on public airwaves. These airwaves belong to all of us by virtue of the 1934 Communications Act. And uh, Reagan, in all of his sunny optimism, said, well, we'll let the market decide. And the market has chosen. And now we're seeing the results of that. So my first experience with you, Tommy, was... Uh, a Two years ago, really, was when um, you appeared on a debate that we hosted at PolitiFest on Sandegg's tax measure at the time, Measure right. A. Yeah. Um, and you came at it from an environmental of an environmental perspective. Um, what was so you 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 chaired a uh, environmentally active uh, group for within the Democratic Party. Uh, was that the start of your political involvement within the local party here? Um, not necessarily. Uh, I mean, I worked on some campaigns. Um, yeah. uh, and that kind of goes back to almost 2006 when I was briefly back in Washington state. But, um, no, I, I, uh, I worked on campaigns professionally or like as a volunteer, walking, as a volunteer walking. and professionally. Yeah. 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 Uh, let's see. I co-founded San Diego County Democrats for environmental action yeah. in 2014 and was elected the, the first president. And it was great because you know, I came from a nonprofit background. I had just come back from Oregon, from uh, working at Oregon Wild, where we always found ourselves at loggerheads with a lot of these Democratic leaders. And it was frustrating that there would be reasonable uh, environmental policy, reasonable conservation policy that we just couldn't get any movement or help on from a lot of these guys. Like Peter DeFazio, who ordinarily, like, uh, you know, Ron Wyden, really good Dems. Um, but at any rate, when I came back here to, uh, to Southern California, I got together with some friends of mine and I said, you know, let's, let's get so, an entity together in the County Democratic Party that can really promote good environmental policy. So it's a place that politicians and candidates can go to for information. It's a place where environmentalists can go and, and meet Dems and realize that, yes, this might be a better avenue for change than perhaps going through the Green Party. Um, and, uh, we started it and it, it wanted being successful and took off. And it wasn't until about six months later that we realized that we were the only County Democratic Party in the state that actually had one of these other than Sacramento County. And we just figured everybody had an affinity club like this. Turns out no one did. So one thing that I've, I've been thinking about a lot lately, um, we are often chastised for speaking about labor as a monolith. And uh, I've been thinking lately that environmentalists are also not very, uh, well represented as a monolith, uh, particularly because just just within the coalition that calls themselves environmentalists, you often have people whose priorities are slightly different from mm -hmm. one another. You've got very conservation minded uh, wilderness habitat preservation environmentalists. You've got transit oriented bike uh, GHG reduction environmentalists, um, and and then you you know uh, 
some for some people the the focus is mostly on um on uh, vegetarianism uh or you know water cleanliness right so there there, there can be a, a splitting of these sorts of things and you ser- sometimes see that for instance measure a there were people who proudly called themselves environmentalists who both supported and opposed mm-hmm. that transit measure mm-hmm. Um, when, what, what, what is it, how would you describe yourself as an environmentalist? Where are your priorities? What are the big issues in San Diego County, County environmentally that you feel like need attention? Sure. So I come from a background that is the first one that you mentioned, which is the idea of protecting large scale ecosystem, Mm -hmm. large scale wildernesses. Uh, the wilderness act of 1964, I think is sort of the penultimate moment of congressional wisdom. Imagine saying that in 2018, right? Mm -hmm. It's impossible to think about, but back in 1964, that was remarkable policy. I mean, it really, it, it really sets down in print how man is not omnipotent everywhere, that there are places where, quote unquote, man is only a visitor. It's astonishing that this made it into policy that the, the United States adopted, and we still have it today. And, and God willing, we're going to continue having that. Uh, but that was sort of the school of thought that I came from, where if you want to protect species, you protect vast ecosystems. You know, the Endangered Species Act, which is a really amazing bit of policy that was passed in 1973, um, the, the current Endangered Species Act that we work with, you know, it works not just because you're identifying species to protect, but you are, you're identifying those habitats in which they live and that, that are imperative for their survival. And that's what has essentially enabled the survival of the Pacific Northwest temperate rainforest that is still remaining. Mm-hmm. And you really can't do old growth cutting on, on federal land these days. That was an absolute sea change, and it was remarkable. And, and that Northwest Forest Plan came through in the early 1990s with President Clinton and Vice President Gore. So um, it just shows that when the United States puts its mind to it, to do policy well and thoughtfully, it can, and it can be successful. So that sort of issue is most pronounced here, and it's not exactly the same, but it's the closest corollary here is not really a city of San Diego issue. It's more of a county of San Diego issue in terms of development in the backcountry, right. uh, habitat preservation groups like the EHL focus on. Um, so, you know, it, it, this isn't something you'd ever vote on as long as you're in the, in the city council. But what do you make of some of the, you know, since it's a, it is an issue here, what do you make of some of the large scale general plan amendment housing proposals that are facing the county supervisors right now? Yeah, it's interesting. So, you know, as far as the housing component goes, I mean, the numbers don't lie. And we know we're going to have tens of thousands of more people coming to our city and our cities and our county. And so the question that we have to ask ourselves is, uh, you know, do we want sprawl or do we want infill? Mm-hmm. And for me as an environmentalist, the, the easy answer is infill. Mm-hmm. Uh, and there are opportunities to do that in the city. There's opportunities to do that in the district I'm running in, in District 6. And, and, and doing so would alleviate the need for large-scale sprawl projects as well. The, the whole thing here, Andy, is that we have to find ways to get people closer to where they live. Mm-hmm. Now, I have a, a friend of mine who runs a machine shop over in Miramar, and uh, they, they do very, very well. And I said, well, where do your employees live? And he said, well, I got two that live in San Marcos, and I got two that live in Chula Vista. Now, they live in San Marcos and Chula Vista because they want to own homes. They want to own single-family homes. Well, that's the American dream. That's wholly appropriate. Um, but we got to find a way to get people out of their cars and, and undo the need for these lengthy commutes. And if there's ways that we can get workers closer to, to job centers, that's something that we ought to explore. Mm-hmm. And uh, so, you know, the San Diego County Democrats for Environmental Action, we took a very hard stand against... Measure B back in 2016, the Lilac Hills yeah. Initiative. Yeah. Now, partially we did that because it was going to dodge CEQA. So if you're going to dodge CEQA, you're not going to get our support at all. But the other concern, and of course, it was being sold as an affordable housing scheme, which it was nothing to do with affordable housing. Uh, but because it was countywide, it was being sold like that. Um, but it was also just kind of located in the hinterlands where you weren't really near anything. There were no transit options nearby. Um, and even the whole notion of, of getting in and out of the area to get onto 15 was questionable and debatable for like high volumes of traffic. So I feel as an environmentalist, I'm always a little, I'm not crazy about building large scale things, but if, unless they're really necessary, but if we're able to go and and utilize infill sites within a footprint that's already in areas that have established uh, infrastructure, that's an opportunity. And so the, so in a a district, in area like yours, which is 
very close to a lot of jobs uh, in the uh, Sorrento Valley area, but oh, also man. Mira Mesa, UTC. And so one of the issues has been the local opposition to 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 housing, not necessarily in your district specifically, but citywide. Um, we run into this issue a lot where leaders uh, support infill housing writ large and then specific projects come about and there's uh, a coalition of neighbors who don't like them for one reason or another and the the, the support evaporates. Mm-hmm. So in your district, uh, I don't see any reason that, that your neighbors would be any different than anybody else's. Uh, how, how do you actually achieve that and make it possible for people to live closer to where they work um, knowing that there's going to be people who don't feel like that's exactly what they want for their neighborhood character, their quality of life, et cetera. And those are all reasonable things to be concerned about. Yeah. Um, we have a unique opportunity in, in District 6 because we have the largest area north of Interstate 8 that has been zoned for some kind of industrial use. But it's often light industrial use. Um, we've got Kearney Mesa, which is actually already doing a lot of density. And they've had some success with that. The problem is, is that it's not necessarily along demonstrable transit. We don't really have, we haven't wired in fully the best way to, to utilize transit in that area. Uh, they're not really doing affordable housing. They're not really doing fair market housing, but they are doing the density and they seem to be doing that well. And I've canvassed almost that entire portion of Kearney Mesa. So I've gotten to see it up close a couple of times. And if we can get express bus services in there, if we can get more bus services in there, because that's the best way to get people out of their cars in an area that was basically designed for cars, that's going to be a success. Um, and I know there are interests within Kearney Mesa that want to do more density on that level, and we're already within the footprint. And as long as we're outside of the range of Montgomery Field, which and the mold on that kind of got broken by Sanders' skyscraper 10 years ago. Until they had to shave it off. Right? Right? Yeah, yeah. Exactly. Um, so there's opportunities for that there as well. Likewise, um, in Miramar and Sorrento Valley, there are areas that are zoned for industrial use, Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. um, we may have to go and potentially tinker uh, with the zoning. uh, And this would have to go through community plans, but it would be a process. Mm -hmm. But there's opportunities for infill in Miramar in an area which has largely been consigned to um, one-story industrial parks. Um, And we could either utilize pre-existing spaces where there isn't anything and and work with landowners in doing that. Mm -hmm, Uh, mm -hmm. And also in Sorrento Valley, there's some room for that as well. Um, I've got some transit and some transportation schemes that I, I'd like to work on as, as a council member as well. And I think they could get some support. I mean, we'd have to get Sandag in on this as well and not leave any money on the table. But we just have to find ways to get people closer to where they work to get people out of their cars. Because the number one thing that I get when I'm at the door is people are concerned about traffic congestion more than anything else. And as an environmentalist, that key is not one of my key concerns because that's quality of life, but that's also air pollution. Yeah. What else is it that you've that you've learned just going uh, can, do, canvassing door to door, phone banking? What is it, what are some other issues that that maybe uh, people bring up a lot that don't get as much attention in the press? Oh, I'll, I'll tell you one of one of the key ones harkens back to when I started on on the air here, mm-hmm. and moving here, I already knew that this was an expensive place to live. And we take it for granted now because we are used to the prices. Mm -hmm. But if you come from someplace else, it's absolutely shocking. Mm -hmm. If you move here from some other part of the U.S. to take a job, you may have to wait several months or a year before you're able to either make a down payment on a house, which there are people who've been here for decades who can't afford to do that. And they may be a two income family. In fact, we both know if you don't have two incomes in this town, it's not going to work. But the thing that I've learned the most is that the middle class is so much more fragile than it was when I was a kid. And we are all one income and one paycheck away from very serious economic concerns for our families. And Joe Biden uh, said years ago, and I I love Joe Biden, but he he said, you know, it's it's the the kitchen table discussion that happens at the end of the month. Mm -hmm. And you have to go over uh, uh, the bills. It's like, it's not once a month. It's every day. Mm -hmm. And when you have these economic uncertainties following you around, it's, it's there when you're picking up the kids. It's there when you're going to bed at night. And that uncertainty, uh, that fragility of the middle class, that's one of the reasons I'm running is to make sure that, that those who, people who work for a living, who get up at four or five o'clock in the morning, who I spoke to every single day on the air, who I met at all of these events, uh, doing radio all these years, that they have a voice on council because I don't feel they've got that right now. 
So what is it that you tell those people about what the city council specifically could do to alleviate some of those cost of living concerns? What it means is that there is someone with a sensibility uh, and an empathy there who can hear that, who doesn't come from necessarily uh, a wealthier background. You know, I don't come from wealth. I, I, radio doesn't exactly pay like uh, your Brian Williams reading the TV news or anything like mm -hmm. that. And so, uh, you know, we have to have a two income household for my wife and I, and I'm not working right now. Uh, and, and, you know, my job came to an end at 91 X. And so while that enabled me and gave me a lane to go and run for office, it's also been difficult financially. Mm -hmm. And, you know, you, you, you meet so many people who they're single parents or they've got two kids and they are trying so hard to get home at night to help their kids with homework and get them to bed. They're going to classes. They're trying to better themselves. They are trying so hard to make a better life for their children and themselves. And maybe, I don't know, take a day off once in a while. Mm -hmm. And that empathy, I just feel that's who I want to speak for. Yeah. So, I mean, to Sarah's point, though, is there any concrete proposal you could you could offer as a fig leaf to, to these folks and say, you know, uh, given my way, we're going to do this and it's going, going to be, try to help you out. It's making life better for your constituents, essentially. And one way we can do that is by getting people out of their cars. Yeah. Uh, you know, making the transit time and the time that you're spent uh, on the freeway cut back on that so people have more time to spend with their families. Maybe work with employers to find a way so that if you have a job where you basically you go to work and you can do the same stuff you do at home, Work with these employers so that you are able to stay at home for a couple of days extra, and that way you can be around for the kids when they get home from school. You can be able to go and take them to soccer practice and not have to go and take block time off from work to go and do that. And I think that would be a very reasonable thing because we certainly live in a culture right now where a lot of people are already working from home, and if, if you're able to do that, if you're able to do the podcast from your bedroom, and uh, well, that's, that's an option. Yeah. One of the uh, most shocking or interesting things that uh, Chris Kate has said in a while is that he has sort of lost faith in the city council's ability to actually do any big thing. Uh, presumably, you have to have some optimism about what the city council can do if you're running to be on it. Um, what's your take on, you know, the city council's ability to pass some of these big measures? Um, vacation rental regulations and things like that that we've seen them stall on over and over again? Well, one of them is, is simply leadership. And if we have a, a, a larger block on city council, I think we're going to be able to move forward as a block and maybe bring uh, the mayor to the table more often uh, to find some compromises and to find some good policy. And the policies out there, it's just the, it's the willingness to go and lead on these things. You know, when it comes to homelessness, for example, you know, homelessness, it's easy to say, well, that's that's the county's problem. We are the biggest city in this county. We should be leading on this. This is a problem that is in every corner of the county. We, you and I have seen this over time grow and develop. It was there before the hepatitis A crisis. It was there before we had medieval issues on our streets. For heaven's sake, we need a plan that's going to address the fact that we're going to have a transient population here for 10, 20, 30 years. San Diego, by virtue uh, of, its, uh, of the weather, and of the fragility of that middle class that I was talking about, we're going to have a transient population here. Let's plan for that. Let's plan for that now. Let's make it a situation where we can take it out of the hands of law enforcement. And law enforcement's able to go and actually handle fighting crime instead of ticketing a guy who's, you know, sleeping in front of a Bank of America. That's a terrible optic. Well, let's, let's, let's um, talk about a couple citywide issues that, that are before the city council or have been for a little while. Uh, Short-term vacation rentals. Um, the most recent instance we had, there were uh, two proposals that the city council came in uh, considering. Um, there was the Chris Ward-backed proposal, which was uh, a little bit more permissive um, in terms of uh, how it would regulate it. And then there was the Barbara Bree, Lori Zaff proposal, which was uh, more restrictive. And I think that the, the one area that was especially restrictive was uh, putting a limit on how many whole home rentals an ad individual operator or company could have. Um, what do you think is the right solution? What does the city council have to do? Uh, does it have to do anything to, to regulate this issue? Yeah, I mean, as I understand it, short-term rentals are currently illegal in the first place uh, with a lot of the zoning laws. So let's abide by the law. But secondly, 
let's go find a solution. Now, I am I am opposed to short term rentals. I, I I am opposed to them. Like ideologically, you don't like them. I am I ideologically I'm not op- I'm opposed to them, and I'll tell you why. Yeah. You know, if if you are a single family homeowner, if you have a house. It is a reasonable expectation that there'd be some stability in who lives there over the course of, say, 30 days. Mm -hmm. So if you have the quote unquote mini hotel happening next door to you or then proximity of you, that, in my opinion, adds to a a feeling of destabilization of the 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 expectations of normalcy in the neighborhood. Now, that may not pertain so much if you're, say, like in a condo tower and you're on floor 10 and the revolving door is happening on floor two. But I, I think if you're in one of these neighborhoods, and we have plenty of, of, of our neighborhoods like this in Claremont and in Mira Mesa and Southern Penasquitos, uh, I don't want to see what's happening at the beach community sort of work its way inland. And I don't want to see a situation where you have one owner owning a number of houses in, in a neighborhood and basically having these uh, uh, short-term housing lords uh, managing all these different properties. And it's and, and on top of that, you wind up taking a bite out of uh, the housing inventory here in the city anyways. There's Folks say this a lot, and I think there's an interesting class element to it, which is that, you know, uh, single-family neighborhoods are, by virtue of what they are, different. They're physically different than uh, commercial or mixed-use or uh, multifamily areas. Um, but it... We know that for the most part, wealthier homeowners tend to live in single family units, whereas lower income renters tend to live in multifamily units. There's something odd to me about saying that single fit that there that there's something untoward about it in these upper income single family neighborhoods, but maybe it's fine in the lower income renter neighborhoods. Do you know what I mean? Andy, no matter what situation you're living in, when you come home from work, it is a reasonable expectation that you're going to have the same kind of climate and environment that you did the day before and the week before and the month before. Uh, It's a reasonable expectation that if someone's making noise next door, in an apartment especially, you can go over, hey, it's Tommy, how you doing? Hey, would you mind turning it down a little bit? And it's the same face that you might see when you're at the grocery store or when you're parking in the parking lot. Mm -hmm. So that applies to all different kinds of, uh, of living situations. So are you saying uh, you you support just keeping the city attorney's uh, interpretation that these are banned, or would you support some sort of uh, compromise? It sounds like you're saying you don't want any, and you think they should not exist. I would st- I would say that uh, the city attorney's position is a good starting point, but I I don't want to eradicate the whole idea because um, for some people who don't have jobs uh, and they have a home, this winds up being in some in some cases, the best way or the only way they can go and make a, a living. So that's not to say that you're going to go and, and absolutely blow everyone out of here. That's why I'd like to go and find uh, a common ground. I thought Councilmember Bree's proposal was also a good starting point. Um, but um, and I I know individuals on both sides of the fence on this, and uh, I personally, I just you know ideologically, I'm just opposed to that. But uh, but there is room to go and potentially find some middle ground. But, you know, I'm, I would be coming from a point where I'd be standing by where the, the city attorney is coming from. So closer, certainly, to the Bree proposal than the Ward proposal? I think very, very highly of Councilmember Ward. He's, a, yeah. he's an outstanding guy, but I, I would stand more closer, much, much more closer to Councilmember Bree's proposal. If you were one of the two who advances to November, you would share the ballot, presumably with two ballot measures. One is uh, Soccer City. Mm. Uh, in Mission Valley, not in your district, but a, a major city-owned asset. Yeah. Uh, one is Soccer City. The other is the SDSU West proposal that a uh, group of private individuals and many developers have put forward as a proposal to exp- uh, to develop that area uh, and make it available to SDSU for any expansion needs that they have. Uh, which one of those do you like? Neither uh, both. What's what's your thoughts on that? It's so funny you ask that, Andy, because um, that is one of the questions I get most frequently at the door. Really? And it's funny because, you know, you mentioned it's it's out of my district. But when I'm at the door, I, I often mention you know, I'm, I'm running against Council Member Kate. And here's what he did regarding Soccer City with sharing the classified city information. And then once I go over that, uh, voters are often, well, well, why was why was the council member so concerned about something that wasn't in his district? And then I say, you have to call his office. But, uh, but my answer is, 
uh, twofold. So let's talk about Soccer City first. So the Environmental Democrats did a forum on Soccer City back, I want to say, back in August. And um, uh, I thought it was well run. We actually brought uh, the gentleman from the San Diego River Park Foundation to sort of be the, the, the environmental uh, emollient as well between the two proposals as far as Soccer City was concerned. I have to tell you, I'm, I'm opposed to it. I'm opposed to it. I, to uh, Soccer City? Or I'm, opposed, I'm opposed to Soccer City. Okay. I, uh, it's a land grab. It dodges the California Environmental Quality Act, which is, again, goes back to why we were opposing Lilac Hills. If you're going uh, to dodge CEQA, I've got a problem with that. Uh, on top of that, it's not about the soccer stadium. It's about the other stuff they want to build on city-owned property. Mm-hmm. So you're talking about uh, a greater amount of use and a greater amount of traffic going in and out of there uh, so you're going to force a lot more traffic onto Friars Road. And um, while I think a, an MLS team would be absolutely at home in San Diego, and I would love to see an MLS team come here on their own dime, uh, I also think that San Diego is the eighth biggest city in the United States. My last check, we're the 17th biggest media market. So regardless of the fact that the Chargers decided to leave, I believe the NFL will eventually be coming back here in some capacity. Again, they want to come here. They come here on their own dime. Because I remember back in 2003 when the head of the NFL was like, oh, gee, you know, we can't have Super Bowls in San Diego anymore because you just don't have enough luxury boxes for the rich people to go rattle their jewelry in. That's not going to cut it. Yeah. So if the NFL comes back here, you're going to come back here on your dime. But I think it's reasonable to presume that they will eventually be back and have a stadium that's going to be able to work for both. So in terms of the, the, the traffic generation and the, it being uh, primarily voted not by a, motivated not by a soccer stadium, but the other development that would be... It's not affordable housing. It's not fair market housing they're going to put in there. It is, uh, it, it is infill housing, though. It's, I mean, it is at the, uh, right on the trolley line. Uh, it is also would pass through if we ever found funding to build the purple line from, uh, mm. from Chula Vista up to Kearney Mesa would be along that as well. Um, so environmentally, is there an, an argument to be made for it on, on terms of dense urban housing? Andy, what's the unusual thing about the trolley stop by Qualcomm stadium? It's very large. It's the largest in, on the system. It's also elevated. It's also elevated. Yeah. That's because it's a flood area and the Murph, (laughs) Jack Murphy stadium was built there back in 1966 because that area floods because you're along the San Diego river. Um, and I don't feel that that's the best place to go and put in additional infrastructure uh, unless you are really pushing yourself back from the river. And the reason why that was such a golden place to go and put the Murph, Jack Murphy Stadium, was because when you have a flooding incident happen there and the water gets up to home plate, nobody gets hurt mm-hmm. and no property is essentially damaged. Um, so if you're looking at building additional materials in there, you really have got to figure out a way to get very, very far back from the river. And, uh, and, and, S- and that leads into the SDSU yeah, West. Yeah, so I was going to say, this, well. a, this applies to SDSU yeah. West, I would say. But, so. I, but I'm opposed to the Soccer City proposal. I mean, it was put forward by FS Investors. This is an investment company. It's not about crafting good policy. It's about making money. Sure. Right? Now, as far as the, the SDSU West proposal, um, the Environmental Democrats actually took a stand in favor of it. Hmm. I was a little lukewarm on it because uh, one of the things, and you know, whenever you're shown things from developers, you get the pretty pictures. Sure. And here's what it's going to look like in 2030. Yeah. And, uh, and that's- Yeah, I mean, everything you've said about Soccer City thus far, except for uh, maybe all of it, except, well, the, except for MLS, applies to SDSU West as well. Right, exactly. And- um, one of the things that I heard from that presentation was that we've got the hydrology figured out. Mm-hmm. And as an environmentalist, that's always a, well, it's, not, it's not a dog whistle for me, but it, does, it is a whistle. It's like, let me tell you something. You don't have the hydrology figured out. Nature's got the hydrology figured out. And I don't know how much land you're going to go and try and push up and push these things on, but you still are right next to the river. So unless you have such a broad expanse of the proposed park and the expansion of the San Diego River Park, which I think is the best use for the site, mm-hmm. uh, uh, I think you're, you're going to have a hard time convincing me of that. Um, I'm not entirely convinced that what is planned for SDSU West is simply going to be purely scholastic buildings that are classrooms and dormitories. Now, I support San Diego State. Um, yeah, uh, I mean, I think it's pretty clear in their proposal that it's uh, not completely going to be campus well i mean it's going to be housing that that students could rent but it's not going to be dorm rooms but didn't didn't the sdsu sue the city at some point about about expansion that's one of the weird things about living next to like hospitals Mm -hmm. and and schools Mm -hmm. is they want to find ways to expand yeah um 
And I'm also concerned about, again, the transit component of that as well. Because while you've got a trolley that takes you from the college area down to the Qualcomm Stadium site, that's great. But I'm not so sure that all these professors and all these students are going to be using that trolley and not using the freeway and not really congesting that area between college, uh, the, the college area and the Qualcomm Stadium site. So in, in, a, in its most ideal form, I would be in favor of SDSU West in, in the best replication of that possible. Mm-hmm. Um, it sort of leaves uh, more power in the hands of the, the council, interestingly, where Soccer City is more putting the power in the hands of, uh, of the mayor. So I would be more inclined to SDSU West. But it, it doesn't seem like an enthusiastic endorsement. Uh, I am happy to be further uh, uh, convinced on that. Okay. Uh, but, I, but again, I would say if it's between the two proposals, I would choose SDSU West. But again, in its best possible well, there is, I expression mean, the, of that. It's the, also possible to choose none. Yeah, none. And that is one as well. Yeah. Would and, you, I mean, you know. It's, well, on your ballot, will you, you, you have yes and no next to each of them. Would you do both no? Are you asking how I would vote, Andy? Uh-huh. <laughs> yeah. Uh, chances are... That is a question that politicians <laughs> tend to feel. Chances are I would probably not vote for either of them. Okay. Um, but if we, if I had to go and choose one, I would choose SDSU West. Tommy Howe, City Council candidate, District 6 on the ballot, June 5th. June 5th. That's the date. Thanks for coming in, man. Andy, good seeing you. Thanks for your time. <laughs>